Well, welcome to this video. It's fairly brief, but I think really quite interesting. I'll tell you what it's about, then you can decide if you want to watch it. It's actually a historical research, and I think historical research is really quite important. The past can so often inform the present and, of course, the future. And this is about the 1918 pandemic, 102 years ago, the 1918-1919 flu pandemic that killed probably more than 50 million people in the world. And it's always been a mystery why so many people died in this pandemic. Why 50, 60, 70? No one really knows. Tens of millions of people dying from this pandemic in 1918, 1919. The Spanish flu it was an H1N1. Anyway, this paper looks at evidence and gives fairly strong evidence, actually, that most of these deaths were caused by secondary bacterial infection, not by the virus itself. So the idea is you get a viral infection in the airways and that causes secondary bacterial infection and people die of the bacterial infection, the infection with the bacteria, they're not dying of the original viral infection. And of course, with COVID-19, antibiotics are given fairly routinely. So we don't actually know how many people would go on to develop bacterial pneumonia because we treat them in advance of that because antibiotics are now readily available. Whereas in 1918, of course, they weren't. Antibiotics really became available to a limited extent in the Second World War and weren't readily available to the civilian population until the late 40s and even early 50s. So quite recent, really. So that's what this video is about. If you want to skip it, um, do so. But um, it's fairly brief and it's very interesting. So uh, stick around if you can. Predominant role of bacterial pneumonia as the cause of death in pandemic influenza. Implications for pandemic influenza preparedness, and this was written before the current COVID-19 pandemic. Now, uh, this was in the Journal of Infectious Diseases, published in 2008, and you might recognise one of the names there, Anthony S. Fauci. Now, his name comes last. In the list of names so he probably didn't have much to do with it actually but um anyway he got his name in there so that's fine so this is prior to the use of antibiotics now 1918-1919 spanish flu was an h1n1 now the h and the n describe proteins on the surface of the virus so it's the way that virologists classify these uh these particular viral types and these are influenza type a viruses uh, spreadable, infectious, potentially pandemic, as this one was, uh, influenza viruses. Um, now, in the US, it's known to have killed 670,000 people. Um, quite, a, quite, a, quite a high death rate. That's excess deaths in the US. Other parts of the world, it was uh, it was way more than that. And, and this pandemic just went through the whole world. It was a proper pandemic. The, the lowest estimates you see are 40 million deaths. The highest estimates you see are about 100 million deaths. No one really knows for sure. But a terrible, terrible pandemic that, uh, that came just at the end of the First World War, but killed way more people than the First World War killed, tragic as the losses were in the... Uh, in the First World War. Of course, the difference was in the First World War, it was mostly young men that were being killed. Whereas the 1918 pandemic had like a W-shaped curve in terms of deaths. So it killed a lot of babies. Now, aren't we grateful that this is not the 1918 pandemic? Deaths in babies from COVID-19 are remarkably rare. So a lot of babies and young children died. Then the death rate went down in sort of uh, later childhood, teenage, early adult life. Then it went up a bit in middle life. And then, of course, it went up in, in older age groups as well. So a bit of a strange distribution, really. And I had thought that the reason that a lot of young people died was because they had a good immune system and they had an inflammatory reaction. And it was the inflammatory reaction that was causing the death. But this paper argues fairly strongly, and I think you'll see convincingly, against the, uh, the previous uh, thinking that I had on that. Um, if I'd been more up to date, I would have probably realised this since this was published in 2008. But there you go. Um, so now it's interesting that that death toll there, the percentage related to modern the United States, would be 1.9 million. 
Anyway, what these people did was they examined uh, lung tissue sections. So they got some old lung tissue sections. Um, and they also got, um, this was obtained from 58 postmortems, as we call it in the UK, autopsies, I believe you call it in the United States. So they were able to resection these and examine them. And also they looked at reviewed pathologic and bacteriological data from 109 published autopsy series with 8,398 individual autopsy investigations. So pretty big sample size. Now, given that these people died 100 years ago and this t these tissue samples were taken 100 years ago, how the heck did they know it was bacterial pneumonia? Well, some had been taken more recently. Bodies had been exhumed, for example, from the permafrost. Uh, in northern latitudes um, and, and, and re-examined so they did get some more up-to-date uh, information from that but you can actually tell from the old post-mortem slides the back the uh, the slides that are embedded in wax and from the reports because what actually happens is when you have a bacterial infection imagine this is the alveoli here are the air sacs and that's the respiratory bronchial there so the air goes in there and out there, the oxygen goes that way. The CO2 goes uh, that way. So um, when someone's got bacterial pneumonia, first of all, you get the bacteria in the tissues and in the alveoli themselves. So they could actually identify different types of bacteria from their visual appearance. They could identify the type, some types of bacteria. But when there's bacteria in a tissue, of course, the bacteria need to be got rid of. So the body sends in its white cells and the, the white cells that go in first to get rid of the bacteria are the neutrophils. So what you get in these uh, samples as well is you see the, the neutrophil cells. These are much larger than the bacteria, of course, and you have this lobed nucleus, polymorphonuclear many shaped nuclei. So you can see these neutrophils indicating that it's bacterial infection as well. And the other thing they saw was some uh, red blood cells indicating they'd been bleeding. And of course the alveoli were also full of inflammatory fluid. And if the alveoli were full of this inflammatory fluid, so instead of being full of nice fresh air, the alveoli were full of blood, white cells, bacteria, Basically, the patients drown. That is the nature of pneumonia. The tissue becomes solid. It's called consolidation. So they were able to see um, quite clearly from these pathological results um, what disease processes have been going on here. So what did they find? Uh, virtually everyone uniformly exhibited severe uh, se uh, severe changes indica indicative, of, indicative of bacterial pneumonia. So that makes sense. Bacteria, neutrophils and blood indicating bacterial infection. Now from the case notes, they know these people were initially diagnosed with influenza, but then they went on and got the secondary bacterial infection. Had these people been around today, we would have given them a course of antibiotics, probably just oral antibiotics, intravenous antibiotics if they needed it, and they were, well, you could probably say 99.9% .9 of them would have been cured. Tragically, this was in the pre antibiotic era it is impossible to imagine healthcare in the pre-antibiotic era it really is appalling people dying of simple burns simple infections um, that are so simple to treat and so routine to treat now we are in the antibiotic antibiotic era so bacteriologic and histiopath histiopath histiopathological histio pathologic that word says so histio is the tissues pathology is disease of so histopathology is looking at disease at the level of the tissues under a microscope histopathology so these results um, clearly and consistently implicated secondary bacterial pneumonia now you would expect a degree of secondary bacterial pneumonia but the clever thing that these people did in this study was they ascertained that the level of severity of the pneumonia was sufficient to cause death. So most people die from secondary bacterial pneumonia. I was surprised by this, but interesting. And of course, it's remarkably hopeful because we can treat, we can treat this now.
we can treat we can treat this this is not a, a, a threat of death really anymore at all caused by common upper respiratory bacteria and most uh, influenza fatalities so basically this was bacteria which grow or hang out normally in the nose the pharynx the mouth it just got down into here so the the virus uh, changed the ecology of the lung and allowed it to be infected by these bacteria is what happened many different bacterial strains so it wasn't just that there was one particular nasty sort of very infectious bacterial strain that was causing this as for example in pneumonic plague so um, people can develop uh, bubonic plague from the uh, flea bites often carried by rats and then that causes buboes big swellings in their lymph nodes that goes into the body it goes into the lungs and then they breathe out the bacteria then other people breathe that in and that's a pneumonic form of the plague pneumo meaning to do with the air so that's all the same type of bacteria so you do post-mortems on these people and you would find that they all died of the same thing or the same bacteria. This was different. It was a wide variety of what we call opportunistic secondary infections. So I'm going to show you that later. In fact, I'll show you it now see if I've put it up. Um, a few people have decided to, uh, to copy my name on YouTube apparently. So what I've done is I've had my site verified. So... Um, if it's a genuine comment from me, it'll have a tick. So if there's no tick there by, by my name, it is an imposter. And why anyone would want to impersonate me, I have no idea. I find it quite bizarre, but there you go. Um, right, digression over. They also did blood cultures, or they had blood culture data from nearly 2,000 subjects. Now what happens here, if someone has a severe infection, like if, if I've done it again, but like if someone has a severe um, respiratory infection, what we'd now call a respiratory sepsis, um, the bacteria get from the lungs and into the blood. This is why the, this is part of the reason they're septic. In the old days, this used to be called septicemia or blood poisoning. So we do blood cultures, and this is completely routine, of course. So here's the standard protocol that we follow um, at the moment. This is my standard uh, A&E protocol from, from last year, um, but it's still the same one. So if someone comes in with, uh, we think it's sepsis, so we want to start the clock because we want all these treatments to be done in an hour. Um, so first of all, we give, this is called the sepsis six. So first of all, we give them oxygen, turn the oxygen right up. Then, then we take blood from their arms and put it in a two, two bottles, one for aerobic, one for anaerobic bacteria, send that off. And we do that. As soon as we've done that, then we give the antibiotics, ideally if seconds afterwards. Um, as quickly after that as possible because we don't want to give the antibiotics before we send off the blood cultures because the antibiotics would be killing the bacteria confusing the results of the blood cultures and the culture means that the microbiologists take some of the blood put it on different agar plates and they grow up the bacteria they culture the bacteria and that makes them very easy to <coughs> identify the type of bacteria is there and also it means they can identify which antibiotics <coughs> the bacteria is sensitive to and uh, advise the correct antibiotics to be given. Um, so it's that next. And then IV antibiotics, then uh, intravenous fluids, then check the lactate for the development of shock and then catheterize them if we're worried about the, um, the state of their renal function, like urine producing. So blood coach is absolutely standard now, still do it. Um, and they did it way back in 1918. And uh, they found that the blood <coughs> contained bacteria in 70% of the cases. Typically, it was either pneumococcus uh, or, or streptococcus. Now, these are very standard respiratory. Uh, pneumococcus, pneumococcus is um, pneumococci, causes... Uh, it's the, it's the one of the classic ones of causes of bacterial pneumonia, hence the name. And streptococcus is, is a very common one as well. But what the strep means is the bacteria are around like this, and they occur in a, they occur in strips, first seen by the great Louis Pasteur. So that's what a streptococcus means. It's a cocci means that they're round, so that's a single round cocci bacteria, and they occur in strips. So where staphylococcus occur in clusters like this. So that would be staphylococcal 
uh, that would be streptococcal. Um, I think the pneumococci from memory are, are uh, diplococcus, they're just two of them like that. Some bacteriologist can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, just going from memory. So they did anyway, they found that these bacterial infections were bad enough to cause um, the bacteria to start growing in the blood, therefore spreading around the body. Now, what are the conclusions we draw from this? Uh, the majority of deaths in the 1918-19 influenza pandemic likely resulted directly from secondary bacterial pneumonia. Wow. Caused by common upper respiratory back tract bacteria in most cases that had opportunistically infected the lower respiratory tract. So they had viral bacterial co-pathogenesis. In other words, there was these viruses causing the infection and the bacteria causing the infection. Double whammy, kill people. Prevention, diagnosis, prophylaxis and treatment of secondary bacterial pneumonia is therefore important. So we want to prevent it if we can. We want to diagnose it early. We want to give antibiotics to prevent it becoming bad. And we treat it if we need to using those sepsis six criteria. And we are very good at doing that these days. We can do that. Therefore, if there's going to be outbreaks of uh, widespread disease, we need plenty of antibiotics and potentially bacterial vaccines as well. Uh, less substantial data from subsequent pandemics. Now, thankfully, for example, 1957 and 1968, less people died. So way less post-mortem data is available. So they were unable to extend their findings to that. And also, of course, 1957 and 1968 were both in the antibiotic era, probably explaining why the death rates were significant, but much less. So, for example, 1957, uh, 86,000 excess deaths in the United States, where there's full data for. Uh, 1968, Hong Kong flu, 56,300 excess deaths. And, of course, that is compared to the excess deaths from the original pandemic, which were uh, 670,000, way higher. But that was in the pre-antibiotic era. Um, the extraordinary severity of uh, the pandemic, uh, the death rate in the pandemic remains um, actually not fully explained. This goes towards it, but they're still not exactly sure why the death rate was as high as it was. So there you go. Um, this is not really a problem now because we live in the antibiotic era. Antibiotics are cheap. We have plenty of them. Bacterial resistance is developing, of course, which is a problem. But at the moment, if you go into hospital with a respiratory sepsis, there's an antibiotic which will usually be effective against that bacterial infection. So um, I expect most of these potential pneumonias to be truncated, aborted, if you like, um, prophylactically. And the ones that do develop, we are good at treating. The only ones that we won't, that, that, that are likely to kill people, is if they're diagnosed late, treated late, and the patient develops a respiratory sepsis, which is associated with a high mortality rate. But as long as we can catch it early, these are eminently treatable. So I think that's a fairly good news study. So I um, thought that was interesting. Uh, thank you for watching, as always.